Hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Last Honest Realtor. I am your host, David Fleming. Thank you so much for joining me today to talk about problems in the rental market that no one wants to talk about. That's the title, at least the one that I plan on going with. And by problems in the rental market that nobody wants to talk about, I mean that, yet again, I'm going to have a discussion and potentially regret some of the things I say, but in the process, actually have the discussion and actually put out there in the internet, in the universe, the things that are happening that people just refuse to acknowledge or refuse to discuss or refuse to talk about. And for some of you listening, this might come as news to you. For others, you'll be nodding along saying, yes, exactly, this is what I went through, whether you are on one side or the other. Now, sides of what, you might ask? Sides of what I continue to refer to as the tug of war between landlords and tenants in the city of Toronto. Now, in last week's podcast, we talked about a different type of problem, I guess. We talked about bad tenants and bad landlords. We talked about horror stories. We talked about, from the tenant side, illegal evictions. And I gave you examples. I read you emails. So if this interests you, go back and take a watch on YouTube or listen on Spotify. But then I also went to the landlord side and showed you an example of where, unfortunately, professional tenants are refusing to leave and extorting landlords in some cases. I referenced a house in Riverdale where the tenant secured $50,000 to leave. Today, I want to talk about something completely different. I want to look at the big picture of why the rental market is not operating effectively and efficiently. Part of the reason are people. I have this saying, people, <laughs> they're the worst. No, that's Jerry Seinfeld from an episode of Seinfeld. But it's true. And I do have this saying, people are a variable. And I literally found myself describing to my daughter, who's turning eight, what makes my business difficult. And a lot of times it's people. People are a variable. And I said to her, if you're making something on an assembly line, well, what's the variable? The electricity could go out. The conveyor belt could snap. In my business, it's people. And nowhere is this more apparent than in the day-to-day -day dealings in the rental market. So the problems in the rental market are obvious. Toronto is expensive. That's the root of everything else that I'm going to talk about today. Because while I will eventually get into discrimination, there will always be discrimination. We just don't live in a utopia. But a lot of it stems from the fact that Toronto is expensive and that causes tenants to act a certain way and landlords to act a certain way. Now, there are issues with both landlords and tenants, as I mentioned in my last podcast. The LTB is understaffed. They do not have resources. And unfortunately, whether you have a real issue on the tenant side or a real issue on the landlord side, it can take eight, 12 months to go get heard. Those are the big picture problems. But today I want to talk about the process of securing a rental. That is the discussion that nobody is having because most people don't know how the process works. And, you know, I read on a comment section, which they always say, or they, in this case, being a well, I won't name names, but a retired, well-known Toronto reporter who once said, don't read the comments. Because I asked her how in the world, I said her, I asked her how in the world can you deal with this, the scorn, the ridicule? And she said, don't read the comments. And then she said, why stoop to the lowest common denominator? I was like, wow, okay, now I know why you don't want to put that in writing. You're calling comments lowest common denominator. But yeah, sometimes you read articles and you see that. And I will give you some of the comments today from a CBC article that I'll reference later. But one comment that I read, it said, why do we need agents for rentals? This is so unnecessary. It just drives up the price. So this could not be further from the truth because if we did not have agents involved in this, it would be a thousand times worse. And so say what you want about real estate agents, you know, say that they're overpaid or say it costs too much to sell a house. I am telling you, there's no better money spent than in the rental market. So here's the problem. Okay. It's the process of a tenant looking at and attempting to secure a property and the landlord listing and attempting to secure and work with a tenant. Now, how that becomes problematic is legislation and process. Now, a lot of the legislation is there to protect tenants. Sometimes that can be used by tenants, I'm choosing my words carefully here, uh, to work the system. Right, And of course, you have the unscrupulous landlords, no doubt about it. But essentially, it's twofold here. 
On the one side, tenants are saying, I don't want to waste my time to go look at a property if I don't know in advance that I'll be considered. Sounds fair. But the landlords are saying, I don't want to pre-approve tenants because to say no to them would be discrimination. That's what I mean by the tug of war. This is a lose-lose scenario. So let me flush this scenario out a little bit. You are a tenant and you're working with one of these agents. By the way, we do rentals and we are not the type to be lazy and say, I don't want to waste my time and show this property if I'm not going to be considered. But you're a tenant and you go to see a property. You book a showing, you go with your agent, you decide that you're interested. You submit your offer, you submit your documents, it's reviewed. Maybe they want to interview you. Maybe they request more documents. Maybe there's a back and forth, who knows? But can we agree that that should be the process? Here's where we're stuck on this, is that every time I have a rental listing, I get emails and phone calls from agents who say, I don't want to waste my time going to see this property if my tenant won't be considered. So again, maybe that's valid, but as I'm going to argue, it should be incumbent upon the tenant and the tenant's agent to know if they qualify or not. And here's where I'll go back to again. The big picture problem is that Toronto is expensive. The big picture problem is that there are a lot of tenants that don't know that they maybe can't afford a place. So let's say that you make $60,000 a year. That's a starting salary in Toronto at a university. And let's say that you want to go and rent a $3,000 a month condo. $3,000 times 12 months is $36,000. $36,000 as a ratio. I said ratio. We'll come back to this because hint and spoiler, it's illegal. As a ratio, $36,000 out of $60,000 is, should I get my calculator out here? I'm going to say that's 55% roughly as I'm doing this live on air, kind of embarrassing myself, but it is 60%, even better. At 60%, you can't afford this, but it doesn't stop agents from showing the unit and it doesn't stop tenants from thinking that they can afford it. So again, I'll say you can't afford it. I just discriminated. I just broke in this extremely hypothetical situation. I just broke one of the rules in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. I believe that's it. We'll come back to that. And that's what's so crazy because yes, I believe in the rule of law, as I said many times in the podcast last week, but at the same time, are you telling me that if somebody makes zero, that I can't say that they're financially unqualified to rent this condo? (laughs) Believe it or not, I can't. And yes, we'll come back to that. So continuing along here, I want to read you an email that I received last week. I have a rental listing and I get an email that says, hi, no, hi, David. I know this is copy and pasted. I have clients interested in your property. John and Susie finished their studies and looking for new condo. Both have work permits. John works as a warehouse associate. His salary is 4,200 per year or per month. Do you want me to do the math there? Susie works remotely for a company in UAE as a copywriter, her salary is 4300 She is also in training for a Canadian job currently. They don't have pets, kids, or bad habits. Please see attached documents and let me know if your property is still available and if your client would be interested so we can book a showing to see the apartment. So here's the thing. Some of you might say, look, that's totally reasonable. And I'm going to say, no, it's not because I believe in process and I don't believe two wrongs make a right. And ultimately, when I receive an email like this, Sometimes I just delete it. And that's really going to anger a lot of people. Now, first of all, it didn't say, hi, David. It was copy and pasted. This email was sent to, I don't know how many people. And the irony is I have two rentals. And this email was sent to both of my, well, it was sent twice to me. They copied and pasted it. And I have a friend in the building that has a rental. And I asked her, hey, by some off chance, and I showed it to her and she said, yeah, I got that. So look, if this person's going to email 100 people with rental properties and copy and paste and some of them write back. Okay, fine. But I'm not okay with that. My job is to protect my clients. My job is to work for my sellers and there is a process. So if you have not shown the property to your tenant and you have not provided an offer, what is it that you expect me to do? Now, obviously they expect me to quote, pre-approve the person. I can't do that. I know nothing about your client. 
this person has given me an email summary. Now, let's say in another example, they provide me with two credit checks, two employment letters, two pay stubs, LinkedIn profiles, et cetera. Now I'm outside the scope of my job. I don't have an offer in my hands. What am I reviewing? Some of you might say, David, stop complaining about having to work or do your job. I always think about what people would say when they disagree, but I respectfully disagree with your disagreement because it's not my job. My job is to review candidates with offers on the property. Somebody submits an offer on my listing. I'm looking at the price that they've offered, the start date. I'm looking at their clauses. Then I'm reviewing their candidacy. Then I will take it to my client and I will present it. And in the case of multiple offers, I can make a case for any of these people for and against behind the scenes, of course, and on the phone, because you don't want that in writing because everything's discrimination. Seriously, as I keep saying, we'll come back to that. But that's the job because slippery slope, if every single time I got one of these emails or phone calls, I were to go and pre-approve these people, well, I think that's all that I would be doing in my 65 hour work week because I cannot tell you how many people do this. I received a phone call the other day and person left me a voicemail, asked me to call them back. So I did. I called the person. He answered the phone. Hello? Now again, to each their own. When I answer the phone, I say, David Fleming, this is a real estate agent who answered the phone. Hello? And I said, hi, you know, let's call him Eric. It's David Fleming calling from Bosley Real Estate. I'm returning your call. He said, who? And I said, it's David Fleming. I'm calling from Bosley Real Estate. I'm returning your call. He said, oh, uh, what was it about? So again, you're going to say, oh, come on, David. That's not everybody in the business. Well, look, I don't have to deal with this. I'm going out of my way to try to help somebody. And then he said, what, what was it about? And I said, well, I don't know, Eric. You, you know, you called me. He said, I think it's a rental. Do you have a rental? Now he's quizzing me because he doesn't have any idea who he called. He's made so many calls. And again, you could say, well, David, he has to because the rental market's so hard. But I said to him, well, were you calling about? And I gave him my two listings. And he said, that's what it was. And then he just started verbal diarrhea. Sorry, could have chose something better than that about his clients and telling me all about them. And I said, sorry, Eric, what is it that you want me to do? He said, well, I want you to pre-approve them. I said, what does that mean? And I'm kind of playing dumb, but I'm kind of proving a point. And I'm kind of asking. He said, well, I don't want to waste my time and go and show it to them if they're not going to be considered. And then I did play dumb. You can call me a jerk. I said, oh, I'm so sorry for the confusion. I don't own the condo. I'm the listing agent. He said, no, I know. I said, so, I, but I, I don't make the decision. My seller does, right? My owner, my landlord, they make the decision. He said, well, yeah, I know, you know, but you know, maybe you could speak on their behalf. I said, well, that's actually like, that's not what I do. I'd have to run it by them. And this kind of went on. And basically I just said to him, look, Eric, I'm going to be blunt with you. I cannot pre-approve a tenant. You have to show the property. Have you shown the property? No, no, you haven't shown the property. How do you know your client's going to like it? And there's the rub, right? There's the rub. All of these tenants, they want us to pre-approve them in advance. They haven't got up off the proverbial couch to go and see the property. They haven't put the effort in to drafting an offer. And usually these agents, they tell me, you don't know how hard it is. You know how hard it is to be in the rental market right now. And I sympathize. I did this when I was younger and you know, that's the job. So point made about the pre-approval process, which we just simply can't do. And I'm going to explain why. As I jokingly said, everything is discrimination, like everything, right? Now, I want to go to the Ontario Human Rights Code. I said Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Yes, Ontario Human Rights Code. The following things cannot be used in qualifying a tenant. Race, color, ethnic origin, ancestry. I think so far we're pretty much in agreement. Place of origin, citizenship, family status, marital status, creed, in brackets religion, because I thought they meant the band creed. Because if anyone owned a creed CD, I don't think I would rent to them. Disability, including temporary, permanent, visible, invisible, and perceived disabilities. I'm going to put an asterisk next to this one. Uh-oh, what's he going to say? Sex. No, thank you. I'm married. Gender identity. Gender expression. Sexual orientation. Age. Being in receipt of public assistance, including government-funded income program. I'm putting an asterisk. So all of those are reasons why you are not allowed to qualify somebody under the Ontario Human Rights Code. And why I put an asterisk next to disability and being in receipt of public assistance is that both of these things could go potentially to income. And I'll pose a question. If you're a landlord... Do you want to rent your condo to somebody that does not have a job? 
Obviously not. But guess what? You can't do that. You can't say that. No for reals. And I'm going to explain why. So when I talk about my asterisks beside disability and beside being in receipt of public assistance, again, I'll give you another example. I had a listing and it was a basement apartment. And I think a lot of people out there think, oh, basement apartments suck. And you know, it's a target for people that don't make a lot of money. I had an agent call me and this agent said, we're looking at your unit. And it was a great basement. It was 2000. And the agent said, my client has just arrived in Canada. My client is a refugee. So the client does not have a job, credit history, or anything. And then said, my client gets $2,800 a month in assistance from the government. So again, I'm not allowed to say that with $2,800 a month in assistance, you are wildly unqualified to rent for $2,000 because it's discriminatory. And because again, it uses those ratios, GDS and TDS. Now I didn't explain at the beginning and perhaps I should have. GDS and TDS ratios. GDS is gross debt service and TDS is total debt service. What we typically use, and I shouldn't say we typically use because it's discriminatory, but typically you would look at someone's rent and you would calculate the percentage of their gross income. I did that earlier when I messed up the numbers. But let's say that $2,000 divided by 2,800. In this case, this person has a GDS ratio of 71%. Now, what is acceptable based on historical standards? 32 to 36%. But you can't say no to that person because it's discrimination, because being in receipt of public assistance. And I put an asterisk next to disability because... There are some people that are on disability, which is government assistance. And again, I don't want to be accused of breaking the law or the rules or discriminating. I'm trying to point out what people out there actually look at. And so hate the game, not the player. After all, this podcast is called problems in the rental market that nobody wants to talk about. And I'm talking about it. So please don't blame me for it. So the Center for Equality Rights in Accommodation, CIRA, I wonder if they know Michael CIRA. He hasn't done a movie in a long time. They did a study a few years ago, and I'm going to read you this. It says, landlords often provided reasons for denying applicants, and many of their comments indicated that their decision was, at least in part, based on discriminatory criteria as defined by the code. The following are some examples of landlord responses as transcribed from volunteers' notes. This is going to be a fun exercise. Landlord required two months deposit plus $5,000 in advance, which you will get at the end of a term, a one-year lease, bank statement, and cosigner required. Not okay. Two months deposit plus $5,000 in advance. Not okay. Very simple. I agree with them here. The next one, landlord stated, it is impossible for you to find an apartment without having full-time employment. Yeah, I don't know, George. Um, if someone doesn't have a job, how are they expected to pay their rent? Now, there's exceptions to the rule. Uh, Billy has a trust fund. His dad uh, owns a company that makes Ferris wheels, and he is a multi-jillionaire. Sure, Billy doesn't have a job. He has a trust fund. There's always exceptions. But in the most, in most of these cases, and again, you go back to part-time employment, or, and I can tell you that as a real estate agent who doesn't have a salary, the rules for mortgage qualification are completely different. If you have somebody that works in the bartending industry and they make an insane amount of money, but it's all cash, well, hey, if you're not declaring that income to CRA, how are we supposed to know that you make it? There's always exceptions to the rule. But for a landlord to say it's impossible for you to find an apartment without having full-time employment, we don't know the context of this. But I'm gonna go on record and say that despite the Ontario Human Rights Code, I don't think it's unreasonable that a landlord would like to rent to somebody that makes an income. The next one says, the landlord requested Canadian credit and landlord references because, quote, there are people waiting with all these documents available, end quote. The landlord also required pay stubs and bank statements. Landlord required applicant to have a guarantor with a minimum income of $50,000. Otherwise, quote, you will not get the apartment, end quote. Now, first of all, these landlords are stupid for saying this and for putting it in writing. And we're gonna talk about that later. I think I alluded to at the beginning that everyone's afraid of you know, discrimination in the rental market. But this is not okay for many reasons. The first of which is you have to have a guarantor. You're not allowed to do that. They have to have a minimum income of this. And then you 
have to do certain things because people are waiting. Credit and landlord references. Okay, some of these things are all right, but all told, I would say no to this one. So guys, let me take a quick break. I'm gonna give you two more examples of this, and then we're gonna come back and we're gonna look at a CBC article, which I cannot believe is now seven years old. Welcome back. I want to give you two more examples. We just left off. I gave you three examples of quotes from the Center of Equality Rights in Accommodation, CIRA. And some of these are borderline. As I said, I don't think it's unreasonable to, as a landlord, like to think that your tenant will have a job. The next one reads, landlord required the applicant to have been at their current job for at least one year and asked to see current pay stubs. Uh, no, no, that's not okay. You can't force someone or say that you're going to discriminate against somebody for not being at their job for one year. I think if you're pre-approving, uh, if you're getting pre-approved for a mortgage, the lender wants to see that you are through the probationary period, the first three months at your job. But this doesn't translate to the rental market. And it certainly doesn't translate to one year. Last but not least, the landlord requested three months rent in advance and lost interest as soon as the applicant stated that she's unemployed. Landlord said, if you don't have a job, then you can't get an apartment. Two things here. Number one, you are not allowed to say you want three months rent in advance, first and last. But the landlord lost interest as soon as the applicant stated that she's unemployed. Guys, I'm not going to do the old, this isn't me, this is hypothetical thing. I don't think it's unreasonable to say that you'd like your tenant to be employed. But apparently that's illegal. Can you see how we're having problems in the rental market? So I mentioned an article in the CBC. Now this was, I can't believe it, from 2017. And this stands out to me because I remember, number one, how stupid this agent was to put all this in writing. And one of my favorite things to do is look at some of the discipline hearings uh, through RICO to see what agents have done, you know? And my favorite was one this... This guy just sounded off over an email screaming uh, to a prospect about commission and just all this nasty stuff. But his email signature was one of those, you know, I'm always here to take care of your family and friends and demonstrate professionalism at all times. And it was like, you put that underneath one of the most nasty things I've ever written. Don't put it in writing, right? One of my uncles said to me, don't ever put something in an email that you're not okay with seeing on the front cover of the Globe and Mail. So I'm going to read part of, or all of this. This is from January 30th, 2017. It's from the CBC. It's called couple in their early twenties denied Toronto condo rental due to their age. I'm going to put an asterisk next to that. Was it due to their age? The landlord wasn't interested in potential problems that may arise from young tenants. Okay. That's discrimination. And that's stupid for you to put it in writing. Here's the article. It's tough enough finding a decent place to rent in Toronto's red hot housing market, but it's even harder proving for two millennials or sorry, it's proving even harder for two millennials who say they've been denied a condo rental because of their age. Ryan Young, 23, and Nina Tassan, 22, are trying to move out of their respective parents' homes and start it on their own. Now they filed a complaint with the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal. It shows how bleak the housing market can be for millennials, as we do not have the level of income necessary to afford a house in the GTA and seemingly cannot rent due to misguided perceptions that young people are irresponsible or destructive, Young told the CBC Toronto. Last week, they provided a prospective landlord with credit reports that rated them as excellent. They provided letters from their employers showing that they have full-time jobs and a combined income of $80,000 per year. The two-bed, two-bath condo they'd hoped to rent for goes for $1,900 a month. So already you can see that this is stale dated $1,900 for a two-bed, two-bath. The couple planned for two of Tassan's sisters to move in to share the costs and help them save money for the future. Let's put an asterisk next to that. Sure. None of that was good enough, apparently. Last week, an email denying the couple's rental application, Edmund Farhado of Royal Page Direct Equity Realty wrote, after discussing it with my client, she decided that she would not like to have four young adults living in her apartment. That was pretty stupid, don't you think? The couple's own real estate agent, Tony Sprocci, questioned Farhado, I'm trying to pronounce these names, about his comments and provided the CBC with the email that Farhado sent in return. They're in their early 20s, and my client wasn't interested in the potential problems that may arise from it, Farhado wrote. Again, this is so stupid. 
They have great credit for now, but they've never had to maintain a home themselves, nor had the responsibility of having to pay the expenses of living on their own, he continued. Their combined income of just over 78K gross, in our opinion, is too low. We'll come back to that. For how to end his email with, you can go ahead and expend your energy in filing a complaint, good luck. Okay, I already don't like this guy, and I think that he got what was coming to him, because I don't have the follow-up to this, but this guy had to pay, because they took this the distance. My reply to the listing agent was, wow, I've never heard of this before. We figured the application was a slam dunk. We were not prepared for this at all, Sprochi told CBC Toronto. According to land registry records, the fourth core unit, fourth corner unit at 3865 Lakeshore Boulevard West is owned by Jennifer G. Through her agent, G asked for a $500 damage deposit from potential tenants, something that's also prohibited under the act. This is true. CBC Toronto made several attempts to reach G, but was unable to contact her. Farhado did not reply to request for comments. Young and Tassan said they're disappointed. Their goal, they are disappointed. Their goal of starting a new, this, this is copied and pasted. I'm sorry. There's a mistake here. Young and Tassan said they are disappointed. Their goal of starting a new financially independent chapter in their lives has been denied. That's how it's supposed to read. In the meantime, they continue to look for another place to rent. We're in a society now and everyone thinks millennials are going to be in their parents' basements till they're 35. That could be reality if people don't rent them, said their agent. Sprochi noted the couple's planned $1,900 rent was less than 30% of their monthly income, an indicator of housing cost affordability. Uh-oh, this guy's using an illegal ratio. I am baffled by all this, he said. So let's do the math, guys. 22,800, that's the rent, 1,900 times 12, divided by 78,000 is 29%. So I want to go through this. First of all, no, you cannot discriminate based on age. I alluded to the fact that discrimination exists, and there are people out there that... This is never going to change for, but you don't put it in writing for this person to say, I don't want to take on the issues that young people uh, have. I mean, the one thing that he said that kind of is true, they've never had to maintain a home themselves or had the responsibility of paying the expenses of living on their own. That is true. And I went away to university at 18 years old and I lived off campus in an apartment I rented by myself, which you can read more about in my book. This explains a lot by David Fleming. Yeah, I didn't want to live in residence. 18, I fast-tracked through high school when there was OAC. And I lived, and I had to learn. First time I ever made chicken in the oven, I bit into it and it was pink and raw and I ate it. And my mom was like, you know, it takes 40 minutes to make a chicken breast in an oven. I learned. I wrote checks. We had checks back then. I had a checkbook. Yeah, I learned. And that was part of the process. And at the end of the day, somebody rented to me. I was living, I believe it was on King Street in Hamilton. So I don't want to typecast like this guy did all young people. You can't. It's not fair. You can't discriminate against them because of their age. And you can't say that they weren't qualified because their GDS ratio, which is illegal to use apparently, is 29%. So by using this illegal ratio you can't use, you could say they're qualified. Where I question this is the section that says, the couple planned for two of Tassan's sisters to move in to share the cost and help them save money for the future. So if you say, I don't want to rent to four people in my two bed, two bath, is that discrimination? Yes. How about, I don't want to rent to eight people in my one bed, one bath. Is that discrimination? And you could say I'm being ridiculous, but it's a slippery slope. And a hypothetical person that I know had another basement listing in North York and every single application was from like three couples right? New Canadians. And again, I want to touch on this later. When I was talking earlier about the lady that came to the country and was getting $2,800 a month in assistance who wanted to rent the $2,000 basement apartment, I can say that I'm sympathetic and I can say that I am in favor of Canada bringing refugees into the country to some extent. That's what we do as Canadians. But the public sector is bringing people in and then not having housing for them. I don't think that it should be incumbent on the private sector to take on the associated risk, risk that this person can't pay the bills because they don't have a job and they're getting $2,800 a month in social assistance. And at the end of the day, as we know from last week's podcast, this person can stop paying their rent tomorrow and you're never going to get them out. So my point being, the North York rental that a hypothetical person that I know had when you're getting an application from six people to rent a one bed, one bath based in apartment, you don't want to do that, but it is discrimination to say that you're not going to. So I alluded to some of the comments on this CBC article. Listen to this. I wouldn't rent to them either. 
four people in a two bedroom, I would look for more suitable tenants if I were renting out a significant investment too. Yeah, okay, I totally agree, but that's discriminatory. Isn't this a violation of their human rights? HRC complaints should be made. This person clearly didn't read the article because it was. Real estate speculation, especially on homes, is an obscene parasite Ponzi scheme. Real estate agents get paid way too much. It's basically theft. Thank you for that. And it added absolutely nothing to the conversation. So basically, people complain about millennials leeching off their parents till they're in their 30s, but also complain that they're too young in their 20s and irresponsible to rent strictly because of their age. Noted. Excellent point. You can't have it both ways. Uh, young people having trouble getting an apartment? Some things never change. A real estate agent is quoted as being baffled by this? That sounds less than sincere. Is this really the kind of thing the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal was created for? An agent called the media because he couldn't squeeze his clients and two others into a condo? That is all. Yeah, again, maybe I don't disagree. The slippery slope is maybe four people in a two-bed, two-bath was okay, but not six or eight or 10 or 12. The rent actually accounts for approximately 60% of their annual income. I don't know where they're getting that math from. If you take into account the taxes that will come out of the account stated plus utilities, just reading verbatim, food and transportation costs to and from said jobs, the price tag is out of their reach. So although it sucks they were denied rent in this condo, they couldn't afford it anyway. Welcome to the real world, kids. The landowner is not your parent. They don't have to babysit you or deal with you if they don't want to grow up. Um, yeah, I mean, they're not, right? So agree to disagree. I am a landlord in Toronto. I rent to millennials all the time, just not four of them at the same time. Sorry, that's discrimination. Makes sense, but you get where I'm coming from. The name on the lease may not be who's actually in my unit. I'm handing over keys to a half million dollar piece of property. Of course, I have a look closely at the circumstances of tenancy. And as I said last week, no one cares that it's your half million dollar piece of property because a large segment of society has decided that you, having worked hard and saved and scrimped and invested and taken on risk, you're bad because investors are bad because landlords are evil. I'm being facetious and honest. Two more. Yep, we've trained the millennials right. Anytime someone makes a business decision you don't like, that's why you run to the human rights tribunal. Uh, totally agree, not in this context, but this was seven years ago. How much worse has it gotten? And the last one, this happened to me all the time when I was a young person. I didn't realize it was newsworthy. Yeah, I get it. It sounds like, and I'm gonna share this, it sounds like my mother telling me what it was like to be 20 years old in an office in the 1960s and the things that went on and completely justifies them. Ah, that's just how it was back then. 20 year old female, I should have specified. So what did we learn from that? Well, we learned that discrimination is a bit of a moving target. And this idea about income and affordability, it really baffles me. Because while you shouldn't discriminate against somebody because of your age, and while you shouldn't discriminate against four people from renting a one bed, one bath, apparently, I'm really stuck on this idea of income not being used for qualification. So I've printed this off from the Ontario Human Rights Code. I'm going to read this to you. Many landlords apply a standard guideline that a tenant applicant should be spending no more than 25 to 35% of his or her income on rent. Those who fall short of this ratio are rejected. Well, this is rationalized as a necessary means of assessing an applicant's ability to pay the rent. Its use results in the denial of access to rental units to members of disadvantaged groups protected by the code who frequently have lower incomes. So you can't discriminate against disadvantaged groups. Does that mean low income? Does that mean on disability? Does that mean newcomers on assistance? It could, but I can't let this idea go that an unemployed person should not be discriminated against for not having income to pay the rent for a property in the private sector. I don't know, guys. I can't make sense of that. Now, this further goes on to use... A case, Kearney versus Bramley. I looked it up. It was in 1998. The use of rent-to-income ratios and minimum income requirements was considered in Kearney versus Bramley. The Board of Inquiry ruled that rent-to-income ratios and minimum income criteria breached the code, whether used in conjunction or with other criteria or requirements. The Board found that the evidence showed that these practices had a, a disparate impact 
on groups protected under the code and that ready. These policies were not bona fide as they had no value in predicting whether a tenant would default. Do you think it's more likely that someone that doesn't have a job and has no income defaults than somebody that does have a job and income? Rhetorical. But in the podcast we did last time, I noted that anyone can move into any house or condo and stop paying their rent tomorrow and it's going to take you six to 12 months to get them out and you're not going to get that money back. You're going to spend time and effort and energy chasing them through the system, et cetera, et cetera. So we're kind of at a crossroad here, guys, because as I've noted at this point, there's legislation to, quote, protect people that, in my honest opinion, may or may not be qualified financially to rent in Toronto. And it stems from the issue that we all know that, unfortunately, Toronto's expensive and landlords and tenants are at war. I have a few other issues I want to go through, but let me take a quick break and we'll come right back with that. Welcome back. And I mentioned at the break that I want to talk about a few other issues. I think I made a lot of the intersection of protections for tenants through the Ontario Human Rights Code and, well, to be perfectly blunt, what's reasonable, right? What passes the smell test? There's a few other issues that I wanted to mention. And the first of them is this idea that co-tenants, roommates, people pretending to be couples, is, is this okay? Now, again, every example is different. But let's say that you get an application from two people and it says that in their email, they're a young couple and then you get their bio. And let's say that as many of us do, you look at their LinkedIn profile, you see their social media, and let's say that they're not a couple. They're just two friends and they're trying to save money by bunking up. In this example, you might say, well, who cares? A landlord might say, I've got a bachelor condo and there are two people who are not a couple. So are they going to put a bed in the kitchen? And again, I'm asking the question, this is not rhetorical, is this okay? Is it okay for a landlord to say, I don't want two different people putting bunk beds in my condo? And it's a slippery slope because I'm going to say, well, what about three people? What about four? What about five? Do two wrongs make a right? Because we see this a lot. We see people that are trying to be roommates, essentially. And I'm not talking about, you know, two girls that say, yeah, we're roommates. And, you know, I leased out a property not too long ago and it was two roommates. They lived together in London. They lived together in New York. They were living together in Toronto. They got evicted from that place because the seller was selling the place. And then they made an offer on ours. And it was like, great. You guys have a great track record. You've lived together before. You have great income, great credit. We'd be happy to have you. I'm not talking about that in a two bed, two bath. I'm talking about a bachelor condo where you have two people feigning to be a couple. Is that okay? Because this happens a lot. There are these co-tenants and some of them unfortunately show up after the fact. So that's another issue that I want to explore. If you rent to Bob Smith and Bob Smith signs the documents and then after the fact, you find out that Jenny Jones lives there too. Is that okay? Again, it all depends. Maybe that's Bob Smith's girlfriend. Jenny Jones moved in, no problem. But what if Bob Smith put two bunk beds in the kitchen and now is renting to two other people. So we have clauses in our standard agreement of purchase and sale. We have clauses in our standard offer to lease. And one of those clauses says the tenant agrees and acknowledges that only the person named in this agreement shall live full-time in the property. There's nothing to stop this tenant. There's nothing to enforce this. If this tenant takes possession and then decides to put bunk beds in the kitchen and rent to other people, nothing you can do. You have to take them to the landlord and tenant board. And then, hmm, I don't know, based on last week's podcast, I have no idea if that tenant board would actually back you if you said, I don't want six people living in my one bedroom. Now, I mentioned income. This is another problem. I mentioned part-time. I mentioned bartending, freelance. This is another situation we come across a lot. And when I, in the end, summarize and tell you what you need to do to position yourself as a tenant, you can see how you can work around this. But is it discrimination to say this person makes 80 grand a year on salary working for KPMG? This person makes 80 grand a year working as a bartender pulling in tips. That's not guaranteed income. That's not steady. I don't want to rent them. Yeah, it is discrimination. And you can say what you want about it, agree or disagree. And I always say, well, what's reasonable? Everything we're talking about today is like the definition of slippery slope, gray area, etc. Now, guarantors. What's the point of a guarantor? 
This is kind of funny. I mean, it's not funny, but let's say that Timmy, Timmy's young, Timmy's 22. Timmy wants to rent a place. Don't worry. His dad's going to co-sign. His dad makes a million dollars a year. Oh, great. Guess what? It's worthless. I'm sorry to tell you that. And if you're a landlord and you're like, shoot, my tenant has a guarantor. The problem is this. If Timmy stops paying the rent, you don't go and take Timmy's dad and shake him upside down and get the rent. You call Timmy's dad. And as I did once on behalf of, of a tenant, I called a guarantor and it was a mother of a girl. And the mother said, I got to be honest, not my problem. And I was absolutely shocked. Her daughter rented a condo for us. I think it was at 230 King. And it wasn't that she stopped paying. It's just that she was behind. And first it was like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm late. And my client was like, oh, okay, I got it a week later. The next month it was two and a half weeks late that she got a month behind. And my client said, I've never done this before. Can you call the guarantor? I called the guarantor who was the mother who signed on the lease. And she said, not my problem. And then she went on and she said, listen, my daughter, if she's going to make on her own in this world, she's going to have to stand on her own two feet. There's nothing you can do about it. So what is the point of a guarantor? What is the point of a co-signer? If you're buying a property, a co-signer has value because that person is attached to the mortgage, attached to the property. And for the lender, well, they can go after that person or you can use their income to qualify. But there's a different outcome there. When you're a landlord and you're trying to go after, quote unquote, go after the guarantor, it's the exact same process. So if Timmy stops paying rent, you have to go after Timmy's dad. What's the difference between going after Timmy and Timmy's dad? It's the same darn thing. So unfortunately, in the Toronto rental market, and I'm going to say this, cat out of the bag, the conversations that nobody wants to have, guarantors are supposed to make us feel safe and they're absolutely positively worthless. Now, what about students? What about students who come here and students have no income and no credit and no job? Obviously, if they're a student, they have no job and no income. But again, it begs the question. If a student shows up here and they want to rent a condo for $2,000 a month, they say, here's my $4,000 deposit. There's absolutely no guarantee that that person pays the rent. They don't have a job. So you could argue on the one hand, hey, David, remember when you told me that you shouldn't be able to say no to somebody because they don't have a job? And you argued that, hey, as a landlord, why do I want to rent to somebody without a job and income? Well, now you're saying that with a student who has no income and has no job, what, it's supposed to be different? Okay, look, how it actually works in practice, you are not allowed to ask for more than two months of a deposit. But when students make offers, and I'll be blunt and say that they often come from very wealthy families in wealthy countries, they'll offer 12 months rent up front. And I have a lot of clients that say, I don't want to rent to students. They're young, they're irresponsible, they're messy. Just like that stupid agent in the CBC article. I'm sorry, I said stupid. He's not stupid. It was the comments he made. But it's the same argument, right? And I have clients that love renting to students because they leave every year. They pay a year up front and then they leave. They go, they move somewhere else. So... Students, I don't know. Will they pay a year up front? Will they have a guarantor? No, I'm just kidding. We did actually get an application not too long ago. Three guarantors located all over the world. I'm like, okay, Bob Jones who lives in Paraguay. Yeah, I'm going to track Bob down when your son can't pay the rent. But that brings up another point. Is that what happens when three people want to rent a three bedroom together? And then it's 3300 and then they all want to pay 1100 a month. They're all on title. But what happens if one leaves? Legally, all three of them are liable. In practice, what happens is the two people that are there, they say, we have nothing to do with this. Each of us transfers you 1100 a month and our friend Bobby left. You go deal with Bobby. Legally speaking, the landlord says, no, you have to make up the difference. But again, anyone can move into any property anytime, stop paying rent, and it'll take you six to 12 months to get them out if you can. So in this case, if you want to rent to three individuals in a three-bedroom house, you have to consider, well, what happens if one of them leaves? It's the same argument, sorry to bring this up. You wanna talk about discrimination? How about this level of discrimination? Well, I wouldn't rent to a young couple who's living together for the first time. She lives with her dad in Vaughn right now, and he lives with his mother and father in Oakville. They met at university, and now they wanna rent my downtown Toronto condo? Well, I'm not gonna take a risk on their relationship. <clears throat> discrimination. Now, is it a valid point? I mean, people do break up, don't they? What happens if you rent to that young couple? They move in and um, I don't know, he always leaves the toilet seat up so she gets really mad. That's such a cliche, but I don't know. Maybe they just 
don't hit it off. They have different tastes in movies. And then they break up and one of them moves out. Or they both move out in the middle of the night. Again, my fallback here for everything is anyone can stop paying rent in any property at any time and they'll get away with it. So it's kind of like all of these points and all these issues are almost moot. That's a pretty negative way of looking at it. But again, point being, you cannot discriminate against a young couple who's living together for the first time, but it happens all the time and off the record. And I have had a client before that have said, these people are live, moving out with their parents, moving out from their parents and moving in together. I don't know. What if they break up? It happens. Now, the last point here is newcomers. What do you do with newcomers? Whether they're here on a PR, whether they're a refugee, they don't have credit history. They may not have a job. They may not have income. They may not have anything. They may be on disability. They may be on social assistance. This is where it's so tricky and no one's going to put this, you know, in writing or in a podcast. I don't know what the answer is because I've said this before. It's not fair. And I'll use that word by my definition. It's not fair to force the public sector. Sorry. It's not fair to force the private sector to do the public sector's job. So as I mentioned, I'm all in favor. You know, some of the guys that I met, my best friends in grade 10 in 1995, they were all refugees that came from Bosnia and Serbia during that big war. They were my best buddies all the way through high school, my early adulthood. I'm obviously proud to be Canadian because we do help other people. But that's the public sector and not the private sector. So if you own a condo, and someone says, I just got here, I have no job, no history of credit, no history of payment, no references, no anything, and I'm wildly unqualified to rent your $2,000 a month place because I get $2,300 a month in government assistance, it's discriminatory to say no to that person. But this is happening. And this is one of those things that I want to bring up. This is the conversation that I want to have. So I'll tell you what, I'm going to sum it up, guys, with this. What do you need to do if you are a tenant? First of all, you need an agent. It's free. And some people will say, well, it's not free because just as the seller pays the buyer agent commission, in this case, the landlord pays the buyer agent or tenant agent commission. Look, say what you want. It's free. You as a tenant can use an agent for free. It doesn't cost you anything. Why in the world you would not want to do that in this market? I don't know. You need a rental application. The Ontario Real Estate Association rental application. You go, you download it, you fill it out. Ironically, there's a section on there that asks for your banking info. Don't write that. That's insane. Why don't they update that form? You need an employment letter. Your employment letter needs to be on something with a logo. Sorry, I lost my train of thought because I was thinking about the one time we found a fraud. Someone just right-clicked save as on the CIBC logo and then put it into Microsoft Word. We deduce that one pretty quickly. We haven't even talked about fraud yet. But you need an employment letter that is on company letterhead. It has to say your salary, your bonus, your tenure, your title, and it has to have contact info. Because when I get a letter and I look and it's like from Barb Smith in HR, I got to go digging for Barb, okay? Give me the contact info because I am going to speak to Barb. Trust me. You need a credit check. I would suggest it's Equifax because why would you take any chances with Submitting documents that now the listing agent or the landlord says, hmm, I don't know. What's this? This is half of a credit check. There are two types of credit checks. I put a note here, full version, don't be cheap. I believe, and I haven't done this in a long time, there's the one that just gives you a score. What's your FICO score? Your Beacon score? You know, 800 plus, great. But then there's the full version that shows your entire credit history. Spend the extra 10 bucks and get that one. You need a driver's license or passport. And again, legally speaking, a landlord and an agent can't ask for that. You're a tenant, go ahead and do it. I don't think I'm being inappropriate here by saying, why not put your best foot forward? Why not show them, hey, this is who I am? By the same token, send them your LinkedIn profile. When I'm looking for fraud, one of the first things I do is, is this person on LinkedIn? Now, there are fake LinkedIn accounts. My friend Amy and I have gone back and forth with our notes. She's a crazy person, but she, when she gets a bone, Jonathan's laughing right now. I said it, you're crazy. She, with a dog with a bone, will go to town, finds a fraud in the rental market, and then just starts investigating. And I'm like, comes up for air. I'm picturing three days, no sleep, cans of Red Bull, and has literally broke apart a massive crime ring, which unfortunately the police and organized real estate do nothing about. But yeah, that actually happened with fake LinkedIn profiles and a fake website set up. But the fake website, all of the links just went back to the homepage. We sleuth 
when we get offers for our clients who are trusting us to put a tenant in there. That's actually who they say they are. So again, LinkedIn profile, just put a link to it. You don't have to. I don't know if it's illegal to ask for it, but by the same token, if you're concerned about income, send them your bank statements. People are freaking out right now. They're like, what? I don't want to do that. You don't have to. But I remember years ago, oh my God. Okay. This was the chocolate lofts back when it was big. I'm going to say this is like 2007. And I showed it to this young lady. She was a dental hygienist. And the agent said, I have nine offers to rent. Do not bring me an offer. And she was like, well, I want this place. So she put together an offer, six months of rent up front, offered over list. And then she showed me a folder, right? I won't say this is before PDFs, but she showed me a folder kind of sheepishly and she opened it and it showed that she had like $2.4 million, right? And she was like, I don't know, 23, 24 years old. So yeah, she makes a good salary as a dental hygienist, but clearly she's got family money. And I sent that, you know, over when I sent a letter and everything else. And guess what? We got the place. We beat nine other tenants. So yeah, listen, I know a lot of you and the people listening or the people that are saying, David, you just talked about newcomers, refugees, students who don't have this. I'm just giving you ideas on how to strengthen yourself and your application. If you have a bank statement or investments that show that maybe you have access to finances or means that don't necessarily come across. For example, you make minimum wage at a bar, but you say you make 70 grand a year in tips. Okay. You got $250,000 in your TD bank checking account. Maybe put that in a PDF and send it over. Now pay stubs. It's one thing to show an employment letter. It's another thing to show pay stubs. And yes, you can fake an employment letter. You can also fake pay stubs. But my point is this, when I make an offer to purchase on behalf of a client, my schedule A is as clean as possible. The most basic stuff, visitation clause. We want our chattels and fixtures to be in working order. We'll pay you the balance of purchase price. When I get an offer and I dig through three pages of clauses, most of which are unenforceable or don't apply, just put yourself in a position to be successful, right? It's like saying, I could go in and review the condominium status certificate in advance of the offer night, but I'm not going to. I'll just make a conditional offer. I could get a bank draft in advance to strengthen my offer, but I don't need that. Just as you would when you're buying a house or a condo, put yourself in the best position. Do the same thing in the rental market. Last but not least, write a letter. Because if I got a letter, I would read it as a landlord. I want to know who this person is. And again, I'm not talking about when you're buying a place and you write a letter and you're like, Billy and I, we have a dog and it's the cutest thing ever. And here's a picture of us. And we offered, I don't know, $400,000 less than the next highest offer. No, when you're buying a house, it comes down to the money because that seller is leaving and they don't own the property and they don't care who buys it. When someone is renting to you, you are partners and they care who you are. So if you have five offers and everyone's offering $2,400 a month, and maybe everyone makes $100,000 a year. And maybe everyone's got an 820 credit score. Maybe everyone's shown a picture of their passport and everyone's sent a LinkedIn profile. Write the letter. Because I would read that letter. And I own investment properties. And I rented to the demographic that no one wants to rent to. A young single male. You know what? I interviewed this guy. And I talked to his references. I was like, this is literally a AAA tenant. It's just a guy. You know? He wants to work. Go home, crack a beer, watch the Leafs game, pay his rent, see his girlfriend on weekends, right? That's the kind of tenant you want. So the idea of discriminating against him because he falls into that young single male, it's pretty stupid, don't you think? Just like it might be stupid to say all millennials are going to have parties and smash up my place, right? It might be stupid to say, I want the two young lawyers that make a ton of money and I don't know, maybe they want to practice uh, their knowledge of landlord tenant at and take out all their inner demons. Anyways, veering off topic here, folks, but the point is there are a lot of issues in the rental market, starting with the fact that obviously it's expensive. And as I alluded to, there's a real tug of war between landlords and tenants, but there's a lot that people don't talk about. The process of securing a rental is hampered by the legislation, much of which makes no sense. A lot of tenants and their agents who just don't want to waste their time and landlords who live in fear of ever putting anything in writing because they're going to be charged with discrimination. So guys, thank you so much for listening on Spotify or Apple Music. Thank you so much for watching on YouTube. Please remember to like, comment, or subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And we'll see you next time here on The Last Honest Realtor.